thank you for joining us again today. Today is April the 9th, exactly one month since we announced our first case of COVID-19 in Louisiana. And here we are today, and with the numbers that were announced earlier today, uh, we have 18,283 confirmed cases of COVID-19 across the state of Louisiana, and that is an increase of 1,253 cases since yesterday. And sadly, uh, we have 702 total deaths in Louisiana. That's an increase of 50 since yesterday. Uh, of the COVID confirmed cases in the hospital, there are 200 and, I'm sorry, 2,014 currently hospitalized. 473 of those are on ventilators. So the hospitalized total actually went up by 31. Uh, from yesterday, the number of individuals on ventilators went down by 17. Um, and so that's a continuation of the trend that we're seeing uh, in our hospitals uh, with uh, less individuals, fewer indivi individuals with COVID-19 who are being placed onto ventilators. Or, um, in addition to that, people coming off of ventilators sooner than they otherwise would have. Um, Again, all the numbers that we've been talking about have just happened over the last month. And I know sometimes when I think about it, it seems like we've been in this fight for six months or so, but it's really been just one. Right now, we continue to see uh, continued signs that we are leveling off uh, in the cases. Obviously, the deaths remain much higher than, than we would like to see. Um, but, but it remains the case that we are seeing uh, signs that we're starting to flatten the curve. Um, we can't say that it's truly flattened yet, um, but every day uh, over the past three or four, uh, we've seen those indications, uh, and it appears to us that the mitigation measures in place, the stay-at-home order, the social distancing, uh, the hygiene practices are starting to pay off, uh, and, and we're, we're seeing that in the numbers, and I caution everyone to understand that the numbers will continue to trend in a favorable direction only so long as the state of Louisiana continues to comply with the stay-at-home order, the social distancing, and the hygiene practices that we've been talking about. And you've all, you've all seen improved modeling at the national level, and we're seeing those here in the state of Louisiana as well. All of those models are premised upon the assumption that the mitigation measures stay in place precisely uh, that the stay-at-home order stays in place, that, that people comply with those, that only essential workers are, are working, that uh, other individuals only go out uh, when it's essential that they do so, and not more frequently than is necessary, and so forth. So that's incredibly important for people to know. Uh, we continue to owe all of our health care workers and first responders a tremendous debt of gratitude, uh, one that, um, you know, is just tremendous. I, they're doing life-saving work. Um, tonight, there will be a collective salute uh, to the millions of essential workers on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this will be taking place across the country tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, local time. Uh, and across the country, there'll be 150 iconic landmark buildings um, that will become beacons of blue to simply say thank you for all that these individuals are doing. So this is part of the Light It Blue campaign uh, that extends from One World Trade Center and Madison Square Garden in New York to right here in Louisiana. And in our state, the participating buildings will include the Superdome, uh, the State Capitol, the Governor's Mansion, LSU's Tiger Stadium, Southern University's F.G. Clark Activity Center, uh, and Louisiana Tech is also lighting its iconic fountain tonight, uh, the Lady of the Mist. We encourage everyone to join in, uh, and if you can't light it up blue, do what you can to show our medical heroes and first responders, uh, who are also heroes, how much we collectively support and appreciate them. I also want to thank a number of individuals and, and uh, entities for the outpouring of generosity that has happened over the past few weeks uh, from both the public and private sectors. It has been truly remarkable. Today I'm announcing three additional donations from companies to help us here in Louisiana. Uh, Salesforce uh, will donate 500,000 N95 masks, 100,000 gloves, and 
50,000 shoe covers uh, to our state. Walmart has announced that they will donate 25,000 N95 masks and Shell uh, right there at Norco uh, will donate 10,000 95 masks. We appreciate all of them um, and we know that these items of PPE will go a long way to helping our frontline healthcare workers. I'd also like to again thank Walmart for partnering with us on bringing uh, more testing to areas of the state where it has been lagging, uh, principally uh, up in Shreveport uh, and down in St. John the Baptist Parish as well. <clears throat> I'm also uh, pleased to announce that we've approved the first grant from the COVID-19 Response Fund. You, re you may remember that the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, the Huey and Angelina Wilson Foundation and the Irene um, W. and C.B. Pennington Foundation each contributed $400,000. Uh, this fund is being administered by BRAF here in Baton Rouge and it's specifically for the Baton Rouge uh, area uh, and, and they created this COVID-19 response fund. Uh, more than $100,000 of that will be given to the 3 o'clock project which has expanded its meal distribution services after some public school systems were no longer able to continue their cafeteria services. And with these funds, they will be able to reach 30,000 more kids daily. The nonprofit is serving free meals to children under 18 in East Baton Rouge, St. Landry, Assumption, Everville, and Ascension parishes, as well as other parishes across uh, the state. A consortium of more than 60 restaurants is preparing thousands of meals daily retaining restaurant workers who otherwise would have been unemployed because of the coronavirus outbreak. I also want you to, to uh, know that while we can't host the uh, annual Easter egg hunt at the governor's mansion this year, we had already gotten all of the candy necessary to have that and uh, most of it from Elmer's there in Ponchatoula and we've donated uh, that candy uh, to local uh, food banks in East Baton Rouge Parish schools for the children and their families uh, to enjoy. I know right now as we are celebrating and marking Holy Thursday and approaching Easter weekend, um, it's a little hard to feel connected to each other. Uh, and so I wanted to share that uh, the Next Door app is up and running. It's one of the largest sites for neighborhoods in the country. Uh, we're going to be sharing updates via Next Door. And we also want to be, uh, we'll be working to get neighborhood captains organized to help support local businesses. Uh, you know, they can place orders from restaurants uh, and so forth, and the captains can then pick up the orders for everyone at once and help reduce the number of people have to, having to go out uh, and make contact with other individuals. So that is the Next Door app. Um, this is part of Louisiana's Get It To Go campaign, which features a public service announcement by LSU gymnastics coach D.D. Bro. Uh, we know our local restaurants are working hard to help feed people and we want everyone to know that when it comes to our Louisiana food you can get it to go. As I mentioned to, today is Holy Thursday, tomorrow is Good Friday and of course Sunday is Easter Sunday. Uh, the Easter story is at least in part a story of waiting, uh, waiting for new birth and we're in another period of waiting right now. Uh, one that's unfortunately going to last past this coming Sunday. Um, but there is light uh, at the end of all this darkness. And I did want to encourage the people of Louisiana to look at it in that fashion. I encourage them to continue to comply with all the orders that are in place and to be patient uh, and to be resolute. Uh, because if they will do that, then the light comes sooner. And, and the sooner we can start transitioning back uh, to some sense of normalcy. Uh, I do want to extend my prayers and condolences to the family of Pastor Harry Blake of Shreveport who passed away last night. He was 85 years old and an iconic leader of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, Pastor Blake served the Mount Canaan Baptist Church for more than 52 years. Uh, he endured many hardships during his life and in fact uh, very nearly lost his life during the Civil Rights Movement but he never wavered in his faith nor in his work towards equality and justice for all people. Uh, this state will be forever grateful to Pastor Blake and for all that he did, the sacrifices that he made to make our state better. Uh, and we 
certainly remembering uh, his family, and we will keep them in our prayers. Before uh, I get to questions, I did want to follow up uh, with a question that Greg Hilburn asked yesterday, and I didn't have the answer to it, and that is whether the $600 per week payments are retroactive. This enhanced unemployment benefit that will go not just to those who are traditional employees and can benefit, but in, the, in this case, because of the CARES Act, uh, this money will also be made available uh, to individuals who are 1099 workers, self-employed gig uh, uh, workers, and so forth. Um, those, those payments are retroactive, but only to the week that ended on April the 4th. So this is the second week. Uh, I've directed uh, Secretary Ava Dashwa to begin making those payments on Monday of next week. Uh, so, Greg, the answer to your question is yes, uh, retroactive uh, to the end of, of last week. Uh, and and uh, so that, that will start uh, next week. Um, and again, those payments are in addition to the normal state benefit, which maxes out at $247 uh, per week. So I will now take a couple of questions that uh, came to us from the public. First, Joy asks, I have recently been diagnosed with breast cancer and in need of surgery. Surgeries are on hold uh, right now. Is there any way of knowing or anticipating when these much needed surgeries and related procedures will be able to be resumed? Uh, first of all, um, I'm sorry about the diagnosis uh, and uh, Don and I will certainly keep joy in our prayers. Um, but if your doctor deems that surgery necessary, uh, there is nothing in the order uh, that came from the Department of Health. Uh, that, that prevents that surgery from being scheduled and conducted. Uh, and so I encourage Joy to go back to, to her doctor uh, and inquire about this. Um, second question comes from Dave. He asks, what are you doing for first responders, especially those working with EMS and must go into these unknown situations to complete first-line treatments? First of all, as I mentioned earlier uh, today and, and numerous times, uh, we are very thankful to all of our first responders, all of whom show up uh, in a big way every day across the state of Louisiana, but especially during times of disaster and emergency, whether it's a natural disaster or this public health emergency. Uh, and, and I want to say that on behalf of the state of Louisiana, we uh, really appreciate all of our first responders. And we know that they're on the front lines of the battle against COVID-19. Um, First responders, uh, first of all, uh, we encourage them to use PPE and we're furnishing PPE as best we can to all of the parishes in the state of Louisiana uh, in, as, as we can consistent with their request. In fact, we have distributed PPE to all 64 uh, parishes. We're also sending uh, that PPE to hospitals and nursing homes uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and when we make testing available, uh, priority is being given to first responders who are symptomatic because we do want them to know just as soon as possible whether they have uh, COVID-19. And we're going to continue to do what we can to support our first responders across the state of Louisiana. Uh, one closing note, uh, tomorrow our press conference is going to be earlier um, as we are going to do things a little differently for Good Friday. So we will, we will have this uh, press conference at 1 p.m. Uh, so with that, I am prepared to take your questions and we do have Dr. Alex Bew here for questions related to testing. Yes, ma'am. Um, Governor, the school superintendents and Bessie's leadership have sent um, letters asking for you to keep K-12 school facilities closed through the remainder of the year. Have you made a decision on whether or not you intend to do that? Uh, Melinda, the Letters came in literally just minutes before I came out, and I have them from the Board of Elementary Secondary Education, the Department of Education, school superintendents, and the School Board Association. Uh, and I anticipated getting the request. I told uh, Beth Ciano, the Interim Superintendent of Education, this morning that I would have a, a conversation with her uh, after I received a request from them. I haven't had that conversation but I'll have it today. Um, and I just want to uh, make sure that, that I'm clear on, on what they're requesting and some other things, and I'll be making an announcement um, 
and, and it's going to happen uh, relatively soon. And obviously, there's there's a really good chance that I'm going to uh, quickly do what they're asking me to do. And so I'm not trying to keep people in suspense. Uh, I suspect that that order is is forthcoming uh, very quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, Attorney General Landry said uh, through uh, the request of your health department, he's formed a task force to look at, make sure clinics are not performing elective surgery. He sent investigators out this afternoon to two abortion clinics in Shreveport and in Baton Rouge. What can you tell us about that initiative? That is with well, we've received complaints um, over the last couple of weeks about clinics of various types all over the state of Louisiana. Not necessarily a huge number of clinics, but, but in different geographic regions. Some of them um, uh, dental clinics, some are colonoscopy, and others are, have to do with, with vision. And we certainly received some as it relates to abortion clinics. And so we are trying to ascertain now whether any of these clinics are in violation of the orders that have been issued by the Department of Health um, that stop non-emergency medical procedures in order to try to conserve PPE that could be used in the fight against COVID. Uh, those investigations uh, have started. I haven't received the result of any investigation in any one of those clinics, and so I don't, I don't have any more to add at this point, but I'm sure that, that there will be additional information at some point. Do you believe that abortions are an elective procedure? Well, I think it would depend on the conditions under which one was performed. And, and again, we're going we're gonna to have more information about this uh, soon, and, and we'll share it with you when we get it. But I have not received the results of any of those investigations yet. So to be clear, Jeff Landry is investigating these abortion clinics on behalf of your health department, and you're going to decide what to do once you get the Well, I, I, believe there, I believe there is an effort with the State Board of Medical Examiners, the Department of Health, and the AG's office to try to figure out whether clinics are violating the order. Uh, that was issued several weeks ago by the Department of Health. Do we know which of the three abortion clinics in Louisiana are performing the procedure right now? I don't know. You know the questions? Uh, yes, sir. Some, the CDC has started to uh, do blood testing for coronavirus antibodies across the country. Um, do you support the use of this type of testing in Louisiana? Would you like to see the CDC do something similar to the testing? Is yeah. a way to like inform yeah. when we reopen stuff Yeah, well, first of all, it's, it's critically important to know that. Um, and as we transition at some point in the future, as we're able to do so, uh, and, and, and start easing up on the restrictions, which we are not doing today. I'm not announcing that today. It's totally inappropriate at this point. Uh, we, we know we have a, a, a ways to go. Uh, while we need everyone to continue to comply with the stay-at-home order, with the social distancing, um, with all the hygiene practices. But as we do, when the circumstances allow us to uh, start to transition, we know that more testing of all types is going to be required, whether it's diagnostic testing, surveillance testing, or this serology testing, uh, because we would want to know, uh, for example, if someone contracted the disease, uh, develop antibodies to it and then have immunity uh, uh, potentially from, from getting the disease again. And by the way, we still have to know, because uh, this is a novel coronavirus, exactly what that means in the context of this particular uh, uh, coronavirus that we're, that we're up against, uh, because we don't know that, that it doesn't come back in the, the fall, uh, slightly different, mutated. You know, every year you got to get a new flu vaccine, and it doesn't matter whether you had the, the vaccine last year or not, or whether you had the flu and developed antibodies, it changes over time. Uh, but, but knowing whether there are antibodies uh, in an individual uh, and the immunity that that confers upon that individual is important, and knowing just how free that individual then is to resume work uh, and to going out in public and, and, and making contact with people. So, so we're going to be looking to avail ourselves of that testing as broadly as we possibly can once it becomes available, especially in the context of that transition that I talked about. But we're also going to have to have more testing as it relates to surveillance and diagnostic. That's the kind of testing we're doing now. Hopefully more of the, the quick turnaround time, the 15-minute uh, type testing um, that, that we're starting to see co come online now so that, so that we can do more contact tracing and isolation of those in, with respect to those individuals who are positive 
because that just becomes more important. Uh, I, I think what we all should should recognize that if if this plays out as we're beginning to expect that it will over the next weeks and months, a uh, very high percentage of people in the country and in Louisiana will not have been exposed to the virus. And so that were, that means that they remain susceptible uh, to it, and, and especially as it relates to our most vulnerable uh, individuals, those who are 65 or older and those who have these chronic underlying health conditions, uh, we really need to be able to protect them to the maximum degree possible, and only testing uh, will allow us to do that, the testing of all three types. And I, I continue to... Uh, to share Dr. B's uh, feelings on this. We wish we had more testing, uh, but I will tell you that we still have either the number one or number two uh, amount of testing in the country on a per capita basis, uh, which means we have really done all that we could to make available all of the testing uh, that, that, that uh, was possible in the state of Louisiana. And we're gonna continue to do that as we go forward and it relates to the types of testing that you just talked about. So we don't about have well. the ability to do blood testing for antibodies now, but you hope to get that through what well, the CDC in the coming well, weeks or the timeline? Yeah, so we don't currently have uh, a test, a serology test for the, for the antibodies in blood. Um, we are working with uh, labs across the state to test some of those, uh, some of those tests. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the same system. Maybe fortunately, we don't have the same system for vetting those tests that we usually relied on, where the FDA would put a test through you know, long periods of, of rigorous testing before we would be able to use it. Um, the FDA has given guidance to states to be able to do independent testing locally so that we can then determine which of these tests are gonna perform well enough that we feel confident in their results. And we've got partnerships around the state that are gonna begin uh, looking at these various tests, and when we feel like there's one that's, that's reliable enough to deploy, we will. The CDC has developed their own test and will be doing these tests using their own tests. And that may be something that we also have access to, just like the, um, the PCR test, the viral test that we do in our state lab, uh, part of which was developed by the CDC. We now have another machine that does that test using a, a different setup, but both of them testing for the virus itself. And, and this is related. It's not really an answer to the question that you just gave us, but I was paying attention to one of the news stations a few minutes ago before we came out, and they were talking about patients receiving convalescent plasma transfusions. It's a similar concept. You take, you take plasma from an individual who's developed the antibodies because they've recovered from the disease, and then you use that plasma to treat other individuals who are still fighting the disease. Uh, and I will tell you that, that that's just now uh, starting to happen across the country. Uh, it is happening in Louisiana as well. And, and so we, we really are on the front end of all of the medical uh, science uh, related to, to the response to, to COVID-19. And, and I say that just because I really appreciate the work that's, that's being put in uh, by the medical community here in Louisiana. Yes, ma'am. Governor. Um Obviously, uh, we learned overnight that uh, FEMA and HHS are saying that the, uh, the national stockpile has been depleted and there, there is nothing to, um, to give states right now in terms of PPE, ventilators, those kind of things. Um, did you get any notification or did the governors get any notification in general that that was happening and do you have any concerns about that? Does that change how you're approaching trying to obtain things like uh, PPE and ventilators? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily change our approach, but it does change our um, what we anticipate will happen, what our expectations are. Uh, we've been told for a number of days now uh, that the federal government uh, and the coronavirus task force being led by the vice president, but, but the, the response is really being headquartered at FEMA. They've all been telling us not to expect to continue to receive uh, large amounts of PPE from the national stockpile. Instead, the states and the medical providers should be trying to source PPE from the traditional distributors and vendors. And in order to facilitate uh, that, that the effort nationally would be to acquire PPE from all over the world through an air bridge, and that flights would be coming into the United States literally on a daily basis uh, and then making that PP available to the distributors so that, so that we and our medical providers could uh, source uh, those materials. So, you know, I, I will tell you, we, we've had longer uh, time now with the air bridge in place. It appears that the PPE is becoming more readily available. I'm not gonna say that we have 
as much as we would like and that it always comes in as soon as we would like it. Um, but it seems like we're, we're moving in a better direction in that regard, so I'm not especially troubled by what we're hearing with respect to the national stockpile. And, and I'm not surprised by that either because they've been telling us to sort of wean ourselves off of the national stockpile and move in this other direction. Um, and as I mentioned, we're now starting to get much more support uh, from the private sector via donations uh, as well. I mean, 500,000 masks uh, from one donation, and these are N95 masks. These are the masks that are, that are most sought after right now. So, so we're in a little better place there. I'm not gonna say that we're out of the woods. Uh, PPE, re PPE remains a concern. Uh, not just for Louisiana, but for all the states uh, in our country and for probably 160 or so countries across the globe. On that subject, several states have sort of talked about getting together to purchase, to use their purchasing yeah. power together. Are you in any conversations with other states <coughs> to do that? We are not. We're looking at the concept to see whether it confers any advantages. Um, right now, quite frankly, we don't see it. And this, this still in the early stages of uh, developing um, uh, the, these consortiums and, and whether that really... Uh, through the uh, enhanced purchasing power that a consortium might have relative to the states acting individually. Um, you know, I, don't, I just don't know that that confers any benefit and it may add an additional layer of sort of a bureaucracy that you have to go through in order to, to uh, place an order for and then receive your allocation of PPE. But we are taking a look at it. We haven't, we haven't said no uh, Colonel Wascom. Uh, to take a look at and see whether the step he would recommend. And then we're also trying to talk directly to the states that are doing it to see whether they, they believe it's gonna, gonna be a, an improvement. Yes, sir. Governor, on the subject of, of schools and the decision on that, a lot of them are doing learn from home through Zoom, FaceTime, things like that. Is that an effective method of educating and is it desirable? Well, it's probably the most effective method that you have when you are not able to assemble in your classroom. Uh, and so because of that, and because we want our children to continue learning as best as possible and as much as possible, it's desirable uh, because the only option is to do nothing. Now, it's not a very good fit for career-oriented classes and, and, and so forth, um, but obviously uh, it is much better than, than, a, than a young person who needs to be in school uh, not doing anything related to learning. And by the way, schools are also, across the state of Louisiana, they continue to try to get uh, traditional uh, uh, materials in the hands of children too, uh, paper as well. But Zoom is one of those options. You know, I had my first Zoom experience just over a week ago. Um, and while it wasn't like uh, being in the same room with all of my siblings and my mother, it wasn't bad either. Uh, and it allowed us to be connected and to joke and, and to cut up and express our, um, you know, express ourselves as, as we always do. But we were a little nicer probably uh, under this circumstances than we might be sometimes. Uh, and, and then I know that, uh, that that's the experience that people are having with respect to education as well. So it, 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 it certainly beats not having uh, uh, any class uh, uh, experience during this time that we're not going to be in school yes sir governor we're almost halfway through the month what is your sense what do you believe the likelihood is that you will allow your order to expire on april 30th uh, i'll have an announcement on that when i have an announcement on that and today is just not the day um what i will tell people is we're in a better place than we were a week ago and a week ago we didn't anticipate that we would be here necessarily so how I, can I tell you where we're going to be a week from now? Uh, we just have to wait and see, and I'm asking people to be patient. Um, and, and, but I will tell you that whenever we start the transition, it is not going to be like flipping a light switch where you go from all one direction and, and then you start going totally in another. It's going to be a transition period, um, and, and it's going to be dependent on a lot of things, including the various types of testing that we just talked about. And, and, and loosening restrictions uh, as we are able and feel confident. And by the way, con monitoring at all times where the cases spike, and if so, you, you gotta ratchet down again. But we will do this uh, as a team, working with the federal government and, and the folks at CDC, uh, and working with Dr. Fauci and his group as well. Uh, and so I just, we're not gonna have an announcement until we have an announcement ab about that. 
I, I will repeat, however, the models that show that the total deaths uh, in the United States related to COVID-19 uh, going down uh, significantly are premised upon us having these mitigation measures in, the, in place, not just through the end of April, through the end of May. Now, I'm not making a, an announcement today, but the people need to know that that's what those models are premised upon. Uh, and because sometimes uh, individuals will throw these models up and they don't tell you what's informing them. But, but those models are informed by an assumption that says that those measures will be in place uh, through the end of May. So we'll, we'll see. Yes, sir. Governor, are you going to do anything uh, with your clemency power, regulatory power to alleviate the number of prison, prisoners in Louisiana prisons? Uh, to First of all, that's already happened to some degree with respect to pretrial detainees. And so you've got sheriffs and DAs uh, working uh, with probation and parole and judges to look at all of those individuals that they think should not be uh, detained and, and because they don't pose a threat to public safety. Uh, and we're, we're trying not to have more people uh, than is necessary. Um, and, and then you, we have uh, an effort underway in the Department of Corrections uh, to work uh, with some authority that the secretary already has, uh, and, and we're looking at nonviolent, non-sex offenders within six months of their release date, focusing primarily, uh, or I shouldn't say primarily, but first of all, on those people who are older, uh, 60 or older, and have underlying they can be furloughed, but if so, would be to, uh, they have to have a home, it would be home confinement, they would have an ankle bracelet on and their case would be approved by five of six people sitting on a special panel uh, that would look at this. And the panel will be comprised of an individual from the Department of Corrections, uh, the, um, the uh, Pardon and Parole Board would have a representative, but you'd also have the Sheriff's Association, the DA's Association, and a Victim's Rights Advocate. And I don't know if I just named six people, but there will be six, five of whom would have to vote for that in order for that to happen. Uh, so, so there are some steps that are, that are underway. That process has not know whether they can actually get the first one done Tuesday, but I'll. Yes, sir. Um, back to testing. Um, and you mentioned um, more testing coming online that makes yeah. the results. Yeah. Where are we as far as someone getting a test and the numbers that are coming out and what's being and when can we see that lag close it's not an easy question to answer because it depends on who's administering the test and the lab that they're using to get the results from uh, and and uh, w one of the things that we don't have fielded as robustly now as we would like and it's, it's just a function of, of, of the supply not meeting the demand are these these Abbott uh, machines that can do a, a test that we received our 15 machines but we also just well a single cartridge is for every test uh, and and the cartridges are being produced as quickly as Abbott can produce them but we can't get any more until we work through FEMA and we're doing that now to try to get more as they are produced so we have the machine But we do have health care and their own similar machines. But these are the machines you really want to have in place all over the state of Louisiana because you can quickly determine that it helps with your capacity and your throughput, but the reporting is uneven. And so it's really hard for me to tell you. And you know, we, we're talking to all of these uh, uh, testing uh, entities and asking them to, to report more uh, timely the results to report more information with the results. So, so that for example, so, uh, currently from private labs, the race of the individual uh, whose test the, the race of deaths, and we've been talking about that a lot. We're trying to see whether, um, what percentage of the positive cases, for example, are African American, and then compare that or contrast it to the percentage of deaths uh, from COVID-19 who are African American. Right now, we. Um, with respect to most testing because that information just 
So there's a lot of work on testing that continues to happen. Um, and, and while we, we've ramped up testing overall in a way that I think is commendable, uh, because we do have either number one or number two per capita testing in, in the country. And it's, we're right there with New York. And, and one day we're number one and they're number two. And then the next day it's, it's, it's the other way around. Um, but we, we've got some more work to do. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that. And on, on, on top of that, with the, with the, uh, the numbers that we're getting out uh, daily, is there any idea of possibly moving to, be, to it being more specific? I know you mentioned the race of people and things like that, but there's one particular parish that is saying a thought process to do that statewide or much to try to do. Yeah, I, I don't know whether we've tried. I, I can tell you that that the data that you can you can get the better, um, but you can literally sit there and spend all your time doing nothing but manipulating data and and, and looking for new ways to report things. Uh, and as, as for zip code or other things, I'm going to ask uh, Alex to come up and, and respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we're certainly looking at uh, looking at the, the data at a parish level. Um, we understand the desire to get you know more more granular. I think we have to balance that as well, uh, especially with our rural parishes, about uh, starting to risk uh, identifiable information. That's something that again we, we want to be very uh, careful about. This is this is still uh, personal health information, and so uh, when we start to get to details where we've got one case in a parish, and we start to give too much demographic information you can start to identify who that individual is. So um, we are looking at where we can uh, censor the information below a certain level if it's too low, uh, but where we have places like Orleans and Jefferson and, and, and East Baton Rouge, other places where we have lots, large numbers, starting to give that, that data out. Then the, the other factor we need to look at is, uh, do we have confidence in the data? And when we're talking about things like demographic data, where we're not getting that from the vast majority of the tests, from commercial tests, we worry about showing you a picture that represents 20% of the tests in that area and people drawing conclusions based on that, when it could just be what's going on in that 20% and the next 80% look very different. So we have to be very careful. We want to give you not only accurate information, we feel confident what we're putting out there is accurate, but interpretable information that doesn't sort of skew and, and send the public in the wrong direction. And our team is working hard on that every day in addition to trying to contact the cases and do the, the contact tracing for those places. Okay, so that's, that'll be the last of the questions today. Um, as we approach Easter weekend, I'm going to again encourage people to be patient. Um, do what we're asking you to do with respect to stay in the home, social distancing and, and hygiene. Uh, for those families who typically gather uh, in large numbers uh, for Easter, um, this is just not the Easter to do it. Uh, but I encourage uh, those family units that eat together every night to, to uh, to do what you can to preserve as much of your Easter tradition as possible. And on behalf of all the, the crawfish folks across the state of Louisiana, I'm going to encourage you that if you normally eat crawfish on Easter weekend, try to do that uh, this weekend too. But don't have a block party and don't have more than, more than uh, your immediate family unit there. Uh, but, but crawfish is available. Uh, they are delicious. I had some last week. Uh, and, and I would encourage you to continue to do that, but just do it on the scale that is appropriate. Um, and, and then obviously, let's look forward to a blessed uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, we will be back with you at 1 o'clock tomorrow for the next press conference. So thank you. <laughs>